Our main protagonist was standing on the floating ship, murmuring to himself, surprised that despite the wonderful view outside, his hamlet is still the most comfortable. As predicted, there's no place like home, he remarked. Chan motioned for everyone to go. Chan exited the ship. Many ladies clapped for him as he walked. He had no idea what was going on since he was simply looking about, and he thought to himself, This is too extravagant. He asked Xiaowu whether she had arranged this. Xiaowu only smiled, as if she didn't know anything. Xiao Yin then informed Chan that she had brought the items he had instructed her to get and that they were all at the warehouse. She smiled when she saw Chiner, who had pleaded with her mom to give her a hug after she stated that. Chan smiled as he congratulated her for her efforts. The old man then informed Chan that he had returned with 3,000 pounds of gold. All of them are in the warehouse, he stated. Chan's eyes expand in amazement, and he can't believe he has 3,000 pounds of gold. And he asked how he got it. The old man reacted with a smile, informing Chan that they were able to get so much wealth thanks to Miss Phoenix's assistance. That's good to know. The Phoenix is a woman. Anyway, Miss Phoenix smiled graciously and added, It's just a minor thing, and he should think of it as a greeting gift. And she asked Chan to take it heartily. Chan saw how lovely this lady was. He stopped himself before he could think about how gorgeous she was anymore, reminding himself that he already had Xiaowu and that he couldn't be frisky. He then smiled uncomfortably and thanked them both for their assistance. He invited them in for a cup of tea. When Chan was ready to enter the inner courtyard, he was startled to discover bags and boxes strewn around, and he said, What is this? He was even more surprised when he examined closer and inquired why this establishment was full of women's things. Xiaowu responded, saying it was a surprise. Why was there a surprise, Chan wondered. He guessed, saying maybe it was her who arranged these things for Xiaoying, to which Xiaowu answered, stating that Xiaoying is Qin's mother, and so she would be residing in the inner courtyard, which will be more convenient. She went on to say that Jian Aihan is the empress and that she should dwell in the inner courtyard out of respect. Before Xiaowu could continue, Chan cut her off, asking if she didn't think it was wrong for them to move in. He was asking because he knew that some females wished there were no other women but their partner, and Chan believed Xiaowu's heart was like a water ladle. Xiaowu turned around and inquired seriously if he was implying he was unhappy with her preparations. Chan's perspiration fell as he realized. He was in danger, and he fumbled, urging her to just do what she intended. Chan raced as fast as he could, and he devised an excuse to get out of there as soon as possible, telling her he was going to the warehouse to check on the supplies. When he ran away, Xiaowu merely smiled. Three people were sipping cola and cheering with their drinks. And those three people's names were Xiaoying, Xiaowu, and Lingzi, and they were all screaming for Chan to win and shouting for him. To earn the triple-double. I'm not sure what it implies. Chan and the other workers were playing basketball again, and they all had auras surrounding their bodies except for Chan for some unexplained reason, and Chan called for De Zhuang to give him the ball, which he did, and he passed it with a little more power, expecting that Chan would catch it, and he couldn't because the ball was delivered. With too much power, and the basketball bounced in his grasp. Chan was impressed but he informed him that his pass was too strong, and it smacked someone on the top of the head, who said, What the heck? That person had been knocked unconscious, and she had a large bruise on her forehead. Chan approached this person to check who it was, and he assured her that she would not die. When he examined closer, his eyes widened in horror as he saw the system. Chan knelt down, and he said seriously, Who brought her here? Everyone was taken aback when they heard Chan's serious tone. Almost quickly, everyone pointed to Baihu, Zion, and his buddy, informing Chan that it was them. The three of them got concerned, and Zion's friend questioned Tang Baihu whether they had misinterpreted the expert. Idea Tang Baihu reacted by telling him that they could only beg for the expert's forgiveness Chan pulled her up muttering that it's no surprise he hadn't seen them in a while. 
Tang Bai who simply stood there, unsure what the expert would do. Chan just smiled and thanked them, saying that if they didn't mind, they may remain for lunch. Chan unintentionally directed Yi Jing Hong to bring a couple bottles of the new Mao Tai whiskey to them, and Yi Jing Hong agreed right away. Tang Bai Hu was astonished and perplexed since he had not expected Chan to be pleased that they had stolen the saintess. Tang Bai Hu smiled as Chan walked away, thinking that everything had been planned by the expert and that they simply needed to entice the Jasper Lake saintess, and the expert would take her hostage Zion. Just glanced at him strangely, fearing he's going insane again. Chan smiled to himself, and he decided to wait till she awoke. He made the decision to chastise her severely. He simply sat there and waited for her to wake up after he had put her on the bed. And she began to gently open her eyes, which Chan observed. He abruptly rose up and began yelling at her. You damn system, does your conscience not hurt? He shouted angrily. And he proceeded to rage at her, telling her that she promised to teach him how to farm. But when he completed all of his chores, you abandoned me, he added furiously. The saintess couldn't figure out why Chan was shouting at her. She then began to question who he was and why he was scolding her, as well as where this was. She was asking so many questions at once that Chan didn't have time to respond to any of them. Before Chan could respond, she asked another inquiry, wondering who she was. Chan groaned and questioned. Does she think she's in a melodramatic Korean drama? Chan then inquired whether she had really lost her memory. Chan needed to confirm something, so he asked the system what a gear transmission is. The machine answered emotionlessly, providing search response gear. Transmission refers to a commonly used mechanical transmission technology that uses gear pairs to convey motion and power. She glanced aside and covered her lips when she finished, puzzled at what she had said. Chan didn't see any of this since he was so relieved that she was really the system. Before the saintess could go, Chan stopped her, informing her that, although he didn't know why she had lost her memories, her database seemed to be intact. Chan looked forward to their joining hands and carrying the science and technology revolution to its conclusion. The saintess was just perplexed, not understanding what he was saying. Everyone was paying attention to what they were saying and Yi Jinghong concluded that the road master is on is one of science and technology. Zion was wide-eyed. As he inquired about science and technology, Yi Jinghong smiled and told others that he once remarked, Cordy is a dog breed. Everyone was stunned, wondering whether the expert was insulting the heavenly path. A strange machine was on the table Miss Chan Huang inquired of the master if he was searching for her, and if there was anything she could do for him. The master smiled and explained that this was a semi-automatic textile machine he built, and he begged her for assistance. Chan Huang was surprised that he had shut himself in the forge for the previous three days solely to study this. The master just told her to test it out and identify which parts didn't function properly so that he could tweak it in time. She took a glance at what the master had created and realized that if this item was finished, would the Waving Maiden Palace still have a place in the Earth Village in the future? She wondered bitterly. A pink energy emerged as soon as she touched it. Someone or something seemed to be floating in front of her, and she was taken aback. This thing, whatever it is, moved as quickly as it can behind her, and Chan Huan looked behind her so quickly that I thought she was going to get whiplash, and this is the same woman who came from Chan's energy a few episodes ago when she was battling the Heavenly Tribulation. Anyway, seeing the weaving master, Chan Huang stood up and questioned how she could be here. Chan Huang was astounded that the waving woman constellation had bestowed a blessing on her, and she told herself that she now gets it. What she realizes now is that the autonomous textile machines will not replace their jobs but will substantially increase their cultivation efficiency. Chan, however, didn't see the waving woman. He questioned whether she was okay and what she thought about this gadget. Chan Huang answered by saying that the machine was fantastic and that it would be more handy if it could be started with a pedal. The master agreed that it should begin with a pedal. Chan moaned to himself, cursing the wretched amnesia system, knowing that he could only make such things from memory. 
He still needs the advice of a specialist, as predicted, he thought to himself. The master then informed Chan Wang that she may return to conduct her business since he needed to tune this item again. Before she could depart, she told her master that she needed a handkerchief to do something with it. She smiled and told him he had something on his face and that she would help him clean it off. Chan thanked her for her assistance. While this was going on, Xiaowu was informing the master that she had cooked his chicken soup, but before she could finish, she stopped and she saw what is happening in front of her. She promptly placed the soup on the table, astonished that Miss Chan Huang was also there, and she informed the master that she would leave it here, telling him to enjoy it while it was hot, and she won't bother him and she'll get moving. She quickly departed. Chan was surprised and told her to wait, but she didn't. Miss Chan Huang was only glad that the Weaving Maiden Palace could now attract the Waving Lady Constellation, but the master was horrified because he thought Xiaowu had misunderstood. Xiaowu was not upset. In reality, she was relieved that Chan had finally begun his harem. Chan begged her girlfriend to listen to his apology explanation, and while he was rushing, he didn't. Realized that he was about to collide with Chiner, who yelled in agony, and Chan was surprised to collide with her. He instantly came to a halt and apologized for knocking into her. He was worried as he asked her if she was all right and if she had damaged herself. She replied, assuring her father that she was well. Chan then told her that's good, and he sighed since he was thinking about how. Xiaowu is a martial artist, so her lifespan is extremely different, and he figured she used Qin Yin and the Empress to test him. He believed that Xiaowu didn't think they would have a happy ending from the beginning. Qina remained silent and not saying anything. She spoke after a minute or two, letting her father know that she was presenting him with the red flower they exchanged as a symbol of their love. Chan was taken aback when his daughter unexpectedly sent him flowers. Xiaowu explained, saying, Give flowers, aunt! She is suggesting that when people have deep affection for each other, they may express their love by exchanging flowers as a symbol of their care. Chan expressed gratitude and gently patted her head. Xiao Qin is correct. What exactly am I concerned about? It will be alright as long as Xiu Wu and I adore one other. Chan thought to himself. He recalled something and informed Xiao Qin that he had an assignment for her. In the nameless mountain plaza Qiner and Xiao Wu were walking together. Why did you bring me here for? Xiao Wu asked. She would know, she replied mysteriously. Chan abruptly called out to Xiao Wu, who stared forward. She was perplexed when she saw Chan dressed up and holding a weird yet familiar tiny box. Xiao Qin chuckled, knowing her goal had been completed. When she looked closer, she was surprised to see it was a ring, and Chan explained that this is the ring that he has been secretly refining ever since they returned to the Earth of Village, he said as he kneeled on the ground, and he continued to say, but today, he has built up the courage to give it to her. Will you marry me, Xiao Wu? despite the fact that it occurred unexpectedly? With a smile, Chan inquired. I do. Xiaowu answered, tears welling up in her eyes. They shared a kiss afterwards, and a few women scattered pink blossoms around the area. Many men applaud them with genuine excitement for both of them. Tang Baihu asked Elder Xia about his thoughts on whether Jasper Lake Saintis still had a chance. Unbeknownst to them, the saintess was silently observing as Tang Bai who spoke. She couldn't understand why they were talking about Jasper Lake. She suddenly recalled those words, and she pulled out a different mobile phone from someplace, remembering that she was from Jasper Lake, and she wondered if she had been abducted. I had to admit that it was no surprise that she mistaken Chan for her savior. She quickly concealed herself upon hearing Zion and Tang Bai who rise and engage in conversation. Zion informed Tang Bai Hu that it was time for them to leave, as the esteemed male and female guests had successfully united. The saintess maintained her silence. The message she sent from the peculiar phone read, I am the saintess of Jasper Lake. In her plea, she explained that she was currently being held captive by a group she had mistaken for bandits. She quickly typed a 
message expressing her urgency as she found herself stranded on Yuhua Island. With a sense of haste, she hit the send button, and the message was promptly delivered. And she thought that everything would be okay. However, just as she was about to speak, Chan showed up. When he asked her what she was doing, the saintess let out a terrified shriek, clearly caught off guard by Chan's presence. Xiaowu gazed at the ring, filled with excitement over her engagement. Chan spotted something she was holding in her palm and asked her what it was. Because she didn't know what to say, the saintess got frightened. After a minute, she informed him that this was an engagement gift. Chan expressed gratitude for the gift. Chan was given the phone by the saintess. Chan was impressed by the craftsmanship and inquired about the purpose of the artwork. She explained that the jade card serves as a means of communication, allowing individuals to engage in remote conversations and exchange messages. She cautiously mentioned that she was simply testing its effectiveness. Chan smiled and mentioned that the device resembled a shuji phone. He also expressed his willingness to explore the possibility of incorporating a video call feature. They were oblivious to the saintess's anger as they departed. She expressed her frustration towards the bandits. She desperately pleaded for them to wait until her rescue arrived. A woman crushed her phone inside the Jasper Lake Palace upon hearing the news of her saintess being on Yuhua Island. She was furious that these individuals dared to defy the Almighty. You have a lot of courage, she snarled. She was determined to eliminate them from the land to protect her Yao Yao. The Emperor's soldiers are adorned with the vibrant hues of the immortal lotus. The woman approached the Jasper Lake spiritual master, questioning whether it was necessary for others to follow her. She unleashed her power as a flower, identical to Xiaowu's, and proclaimed arrogantly that no one would try to stop her and the seven colors everlasting lotus. According to her, the Feathering Islands are a desolate place with a sparse population. She pondered the method of locating the saintess. The Holy Master of Jasper Lake responded, informing her that when you look at the whole eastern area, the only ones capable of catching the saintess are the Chan Dynasty, and that she will meet this empress personally. The Holy Master of Jasper Lake arrived to the Nine Dragon Palace Plaza. She scowled, gazing about, and was unimpressed to find the capital of the Chan dynasty. Why aren't there any guards here? She wondered. The Empress teleported there and said that they were unnecessary. Jasper Lake's holy master quickly questioned whether she had abducted her Yao Yao. The Empress smiled as if nothing was wrong. She began to release her aura, stating it was harsh of her to say so, but she responded to her inquiry by informing her that she is the administrator appointed by the higher accountable for the complete technology's revolution. She then informed her that working for Chan is a beautiful honor, and how could she be kidnapped? Jasper Lake Holy Master grew irate immediately, and she unleashed her power, telling her that Yao Yao is the Saint Lady of the Yao Pond, and she yelled, asking her what right she had to appoint her. When the Empress released her dragon, she mocked her, saying how foolish she was, and she informed her that her ability was the authority. Both of them clashed, but something appeared in the center, and both women were perplexed as to what had transpired. Both the Empress and the spiritual Lord of Jasper Lake stopped fighting, and the Empress asked this green guy who he was to infiltrate the Nine Dragon City. When the green man glanced around, he realized his teleportation worked. He was shocked to see Her Highness when he glanced to the side. He introduced himself, stating that he is Shuai Phantom from the Abandoned Abyss. He said that he had come to ask Her Highness to propose him to the ultimate ruler. Jasper Lake Holy Master tried not to chuckle as she told him that he looked like this and called himself Shuai Phantom. The Empress was apprehensive, and she informed him that they do. Except talents, but she lost track of a specific point on what he said. She was taken aback when she realized he was the Heist Emperor, right? before I go any farther. I only wanted to point out that Jasper Lake's spiritual master was trying not to laugh at his moniker since Shuai Phantom means extremely handsome. Jasper Lake Holy Master was astonished to learn that this man is one of the 
cultivators from ancient times who would vanish and only reappear when the new world arrived. Are those rumors true? She inquired. Shuai Fanton was astounded that the Jasper Lake Holy Master knew so much, and he responded by telling her there's limitations in time and amount with this method. The ultimate emperor, he added, could resuscitate all spiritual energy in the Shinwu continent. Thus, he must know the true method to attain immortality, he said. When Jasper Lake's spiritual master heard that, she was taken aback. And Shuai Fanton made a pledge stating, I Shuai Fanton, I'm willing to follow the upper in search of immortality. What a shallow person. The Empress said that the Tao that the upper are seeking is technology, and that with technology, even mortals might break mountains and traverse a thousand miles. I'm presuming she's referring to automobiles and other items that might physically split the mountain in half. The Holy Master of Jasper Lake bowed and assured the Empress that she, too, is eager to assist the ultimate emperor. She is prepared to assist since she believes the upper is clever and that they may have the answers to Yao Yao, the saintesses. Mysteries Shuai Fanton and the Empress were stunned, the Empress a little perplexed, knowing that she was about to fight her a minute ago, and now she wants to assist, she agreed because she is eager to help. The Empress used a fire teleportation gate for them all to use, and she promised them both that they would see the ultimate emperor together. Chan and the system strolled side by side on the unnamed mountaintop. Chan decided to reach out to Xiaowu through a video call, hoping to catch a glimpse of her. Xiaowu was pleased, and she affirmed that she could plainly see him. The saintess was speechless since she had no idea the phone could do that. Chan was relieved because this was more handy than a handphone. The saintess still can't believe Chan is able to make the communication jade plate. Perform video calls. Oh, a mobile phone is called a jade plate in this world. Chan looked at the system and told her that he wanted to build a local area network at Earth Village so that everyone could communicate with each other. Chan asked if she understood the order, and she automatically replied. No problem and they would just have to build a base at the station at the Nameless Mountain. She suddenly covered her mouth in surprise, not understanding why she had done what Chan had commanded her to do. And she wonders what a base station is. A fire gate teleportation emerged suddenly behind her, and the ground began to tremble. What's going on? Chan yelled. Is there an earthquake? He expressed his fear for his life. The saintess just fell down in pain the Empress and the others, appeared through the teleportation, and the Empress called out to Chan politely, a tiny flush on her cheeks. Chan was just stunned to see her. Yao Pond, the Jasper Lake spiritual master, asked Yao Yao if she was okay, but she couldn't respond since she had been knocked unconscious. Chan was astonished by her ability to teleport, which made him pleased, but it also terrified him. The Empress stood, out stating that their Chan dynasty is in the midst of a technological revolution. Therefore, she summoned subordinates here to study. She informed the master. Chan told them that they may proceed when Yao had calmed down. Shuai Fanton was dumbfounded as he looked around, feeling something. Then Shuai Fanton whispered to Yao Pan that all the saint commanders of the six troops of the middle continent had arrived and he informed her again in hushed tones that they are all old acquaintances, and Yao Pan the Jasper Lake Holy Master cursed, wondering whether they had followed him. This is the Elder Tree, if you're wondering who it is. I didn't see it at first because of his demeanor, but I did notice the beard. You see those blue eyes that are glowing? Yeah, those two were as well, and... He was able to transform into this. The Chan Dynasty invader couldn't believe the Elder Tree had turned like this. He inquired of the other individual when the Elder Tree grew so strong. The second person was astounded that the Elder Tree could control them using all of those imaginary tricks. The mysterious ladies verified that they are the center commanders of the six armies of the Middle Continent, but they must be elderly and stealthy to meet. Before I continue, I'd want to explain why I mentioned her as the Unknown Lady. The reason for this is that I still don't recognize this lady. I had to go back and look at the prior drawings to figure out who the lady was, and when I did, I was shocked. 
she seems to be a completely different person. Anyway, Xiao will warn them that if they broke into the unnamed mountain without authorization again, they shouldn't blame her if they were punished harshly. She made a threat. The elder tree told the new empress Xiaowu that there was no need for her to do anything and that she should just let him do it. And he flung the six forces of the middle continent, which caused many of them to scream. A woman adorned with foxtails was taken aback as she was impressed that the elder tree was still alive. She smiled and mumbled to herself. I miss you so much. Her body was surrounded by a dark purple glow. The saintess awoke, and she was perplexed about what had occurred to her. When she saw the Jasper Lake Holy Master, she asked if she was her master. Yao Pan affirmed that she was, and she told her that she had gone through a lot recently. She sobbed, telling her that she had been abducted by Chan and that she mistook him as her savior. She continued to scream, telling her that she had to teach him a lesson. Chan was astonished that they knew one other, and he uncomfortably smiled since he heard what she said. Yao Pan had just wiped Yao Yao's tears away. The Empress attempted not to chuckle, claiming that she was unaware of such a coincidence. She thought Chan was pretending that the Jasper Lake spiritual master was unfamiliar with the saintess. Chan realized the saintess had misunderstood so he informed her that he had struck Yao Yao by mistake. The saintess just hid behind Yao Pond. Chan simply said that she had amnesia after being struck, and even Zion had no idea where she lived, so all he could do was let her remain here for the time being. The saintess laughed, thinking that this was a terrible statement and that her lord would not believe him. She trusted him, stated the Jasper Lake Holy Master, adding young Master Chan. The saintess mouth fell in shock. She couldn't believe what had just happened just now. The saintess couldn't comprehend what had just transpired and couldn't understand why she was referring to Chan as young master Chan. Chan simply stood there, unsure what to do since he was quiet, waiting to hear what she had to say. Yao Pan praised him, telling him he was an ambitious person, and she was prepared to tell him the mystery of Yao Yao's upbringing in the hopes that he might assist her. The saintess was taken aback as she didn't know she had a secret. Yao Pan took her hand in hers and said that when she took her in, she realized she had two souls in her body. She smiled and told her that it seems there's some deformation with that other soul in which it might leave the body sometimes. The saintess started to realize why she faints so frequently and have false memories. Chan pondered whether the other soul was represented by the system. He inquired as to how they might repair the saintess's other deformed soul. The empress was only standing there, amazed by this information that the saint leader of the Yao Pan brought, which piqued Chan's curiosity. She glanced down and said that she had heard that the nine Jedi had high spiritual energy, and that they wore antique. Saint Artifacts Yao Pan informed Chan that they may be able to achieve something if they can borrow their powers. Chan then asked the Empress whether she knew anything about the Nine Jedi. Yes, she said, but she didn't know where those Nine Jedi were. Miss Phoenix entered and listened intently as they discussed. She then asked about earlier why the young master was looking for them. Chan looked at her, and he asked if she knew the Nine Jedi Miss Phoenix smiled since she had been waiting for days and now will finally be able to shine. She revealed that the Nine Jedi are just the names of the strongest seals themselves. Chan was taken aback by the fact that they were the strongest in the world. He questioned their desire to seal themselves. Miss Phoenix responded, explaining that. This is due to the ongoing flow of spiritual energy between heaven and earth. One who got it meant that another would miss out on the opportunity to break through. She then began to relate the narrative explaining that legend has it that every century, only one person would be able to unlock the door of destiny, thereby rising and becoming immortal. During ancient times, all martial artists would fight to see who would be the first to unlock the door. And the most recent wall occurred here, which is where the moniker, Feathering Island, originated from, she said. She went on to say that those who failed would shut themselves up and wait until the moment came again. Chan grew thoughtful, and he realized that resources are limited, and what one man gains is another's loss. He thought to 
himself. This is very similar to Earth. Chan touched her shoulder and told her that he had no idea she was so knowledgeable about the Shinwu continent's history. Miss Phoenix was overjoyed to hear that, and she told him that it was nothing as long as she could assist him. Before Chan could say anything further, Chan glanced at the Empress and informed her that the remnant of Yao Yao's soul was vital to him. The Empress smiled and added that Xiao Wu saved her life, so it's only reasonable that she aids him. All right, Chan exclaimed. He informed Miss Phoenix that he would hire her as Earth Village's history consultant, and she would get several rewards as a result of it. Miss Phoenix was pleased and she took satisfaction in the fact that living a long life had advantages. The Empress just gave an embarrassed smile. Chan and his pets are making their way toward Qingxi town, and the master was just humming to himself. While humming, he was thinking to himself about how cultivators grow with spiritual energy, and ordinary people progress with technology. The bird was merely hovering about Chan for some inexplicable purpose, and Deshan was smiling grimly. An even stranger Xiao Bai was licking Chan's leg. Chan felt ecstatic in his head, believing that if Yao Yao's spirit could be repaired, all of the knowledge in the system would be his, and he knew it wouldn't be difficult to get a trial slot for his invention. Based on his reputation in Qingxi Town, inside Qingxi Town, many were shouting, It hurts, while others were simply lying there dead, as did numerous animals. Chan cursed, unable to believe that the revolution had finished just as it had begun. Many villagers stared at Chan in disbelief as he asked what had occurred here. Many locals ran up to him. They were overjoyed that the young master had arrived. The old man was thrilled that Master Chan had returned. The old man said that after the earthquake, the water in the tiny steam became crimson, and all the villagers were bettered in after drinking the water. While he was saying this, the other villagers were wide-eyed and puzzled as to what he was doing. The old man also informed him that demonic beasts are spreading havoc everywhere. The elderly guy groaned and said that he did not want to discuss all of the calamities. Chan was silent in disbelief, unable to comprehend what had occurred. Chan was worried, so he told the elderly guy not to worry because he would assist them all solve the situation. That made the elderly guy happy. Chan pulled out his phone and directed Yi Jinghong to gather all of his underlings to Qingxi Town as soon as possible. Yi Jinghong promptly led all of the underlings to Qingxi Town, where they had all of the necessary equipment. Many locals were pleased and shocked that Chan's workers could do so much, and the water, hospital, and residential areas have all been repaired, and they have done a fantastic job. Chan inquired, unsure whether this was the demonic beast that had attacked Qingxi Town. Xiaowu examined it and informed the Supreme Emperor that it is not a demonic beast, but rather those regular livestock that had mutated after being possessed by Soul Remnant. After the explanation, Chan, Miss Phoenix, and the system approached the chicken to check it. After Xiaowu said Soul Remnant, Miss Phoenix added that the Feathering Island is an ancient battleground so it may be the sole remnants of all the warriors who perished here. Chan realizes that not just Qingxi village, but the whole Feathering Island would be in disarray. Xiaowu assured the Supreme Emperor that he should not worry and that he could check the steam. She'll take care of this area. She said this while waving her hand about the area. Okay, responded Chan, agreeing with what she stated. Chan glanced at the saintess and asked if she wanted to accompany them. The saintess looked away from him in anger, informing him that, of course, she was coming. And she warned him not to misinterpret this. Just because her master stated he was a wonderful guy didn't imply she'd have a good connection with him. The Supreme Emperor smiled, not expecting the system to be such a tsundra. The system instructed Sister Phoenix to leave because they needed to get to the bottom of this, she stated earnestly, and Miss Phoenix merely trailed after. The top steam of the minor steam was outside of Qingxi town, and it was a magnificent forest. In the same spot, a peculiar whirling force emerged in the center of the trees, and a space gap appeared. Two guys screamed and fell on the Shinwu continent. They both stopped themselves by adopting an air technique, which allows 
them to float in the air. The person in the red cape was happy that they weren't shattered by the space door. The other person told the other that the Shinwu continent is simply a low-rank plane, yet the spiritual energy here is plentiful, he continued, staring at his hands in astonishment. The man in the red cape was shocked, realizing why old men continue to attempt to get here despite the planet's restrictions, and knowing that the gateway to space is basically a one-way ticket to death, they must have realized that the Shinwu continent is not in their control. The other person suddenly spotted something and he pointed to it, encouraging the other two to have a look. And when he did, he was blown away by how gorgeous the ladies are, and both of these guys were staring at them like a piece of meat arguing over who to take. Did they all realize they were being watched? No, they didn't. By barking at these two, Xiao Bai alerted his owner, and Chan immediately got attentive, asking his dog what it was and if he discovered anything. Miss Phoenix and the Saintess were taken aback as the golden blast slammed at them. Chan was taken aback since he had no idea what was going on. He was astonished when he turned back, and he questioned these two fools what they were doing, and he threatened them to let them go. But the moron didn't listen, and they carried on as before. The fool asked Chan whether he knew who he was talking about. Chan shouted at him telling him he didn't care and that he should let them go. With a smile, the other fool in a crimson cloak informed him that they were from the outside realm, the ones who would rule this world. He made fun of Chan and the Shinwu continent, claiming that even the greatest on the Shinwu continent would be a servant to them, much alone a mortal like him. Chan was astounded to learn that they were martial artists from another dimension. The other fool mistook him for terrified. Chan then feigned to be afraid, telling them that since both masters here are so strong, why don't they simply forgive them? Both the fool and the other one relaxed their guard. And when Chan saw that they had truly let down their defenses, he took advantage of the opportunity to hit them, and he convinced himself that he had to gamble on it. Chan then utilized the arrows on his sleeves to target both of the fools, not realizing that he had inadvertently used his abilities again while they were not. Looking, causing both of them to scream in agony Chan began to run, and he instructed both females to do the same so as not to be startled. Because she didn't anticipate Chan to flee, the saintess merely stood there. Chan was unconcerned, in fact, he was delighted to inform them that as long as they remained surprising, they would be able to defeat anybody who is powerful, the empress and this. Phoenix both thought at the same moment, yes, yeah, certainly, we know. What's going on here is that Chan assumed Miss Phoenix and the Saintess were the ones who destroyed those people by being surprising, not realizing that he was the one who defeated them with a single shot. The two fools were still screaming in anguish as they attempted to extract the arrows from the corpse some minutes later. They were both gritting their teeth in anguish as they tried to remove their arrows from their bodies. The man with the red cape was upset since he was able to evade the arrow but couldn't move because of this limiting mastery. What the hell is going on? He muttered this while fighting to remove his arrow from his body. When the second fool took the arrow from his leg, he said to his other stupid. Pal, this is horrifying. He wondered whether he was the one who brought such drastic changes to the Shinwu continent. Both the bastards began to flee telling his companion that this world is dangerous and that they should just leave, the bastard with the crimson cape was still working to remove the arrow. As he was struggling he realized something and wondered why he had simply let them go. The overweight person just told him not to worry about it and to flee while he could. The fat bastard was happy that the space door did not shut, and he pledged that they would return for their vengeance. The other guy cursed, claiming that this was not over since he was still in excruciating agony. But before they could go fully, someone touched the space door, causing it to stop shutting. This person said that they discovered them. Both bastards were stunned and perplexed as to how this individual accomplished such a feat this person attacked using a technique, and both of them screamed in agony. They were attacked again, and the other bastard wearing a crimson cloak was blasted away killing both of them. And it was the saintess who was attacking them, who smiled and said, That's what they get for disrespecting her. Chan was definitely quiet, not saying anything. 
he realized this was their escape route. He muttered to himself that it didn't appear like the teleportation door they'd used to return to the Chan dynasty with the Empress. Miss Phoenix abruptly grabbed up Chan from the ground. When she heard him mention teleportation, she decided to lift him up and fly there. Chan stared at the earth and questioned hesitantly. Why don't we go into details when we're on the ground? Why can't he just have a flying magic device like Xiaowu? He thought. The saintess gave Chan a thumbs up, informing him that everything is well and that she promised to take care of everything. He was okay with it, but he was astonished that she was thrilled to do this. Miss Phoenix gracefully descended to the ground, and she informed Chan that Her Highness Tunnel could only take them between two locations. Miss Phoenix revealed that the two bastards were able to break through time and move between space without any limitations. While they were talking the saintess absorbed the door of space. When Miss Phoenix said, Break through time and space, Chan gasped in surprise. Isn't that a wormhole? He yelled, cursing. Miss Phoenix was perplexed, not understanding what a wormhole was. When he eventually realized that those two plainly originated from a planet with greater spirits and energy, Chan recognized that the Shinwu continent had already entered the era of tragic drama. Miss Phoenix misunderstood Chan's words and questioned why he referred to them as worms emerging from holes. Chan began to shed joyful tears as he murmured finally. Miss Phoenix was perplexed and had no idea what was going on. The master began to laugh, and he was relieved that he would soon be able to return home thanks to a man-made wormhole. Miss Phoenix fully misinterpreted what he said, and she assumed that since she believed she understood, he must have a superior grasp of all creation. All creations are merely dogs, is all. Creations are mere worms. She assumed Chan was thinking when he mentioned wormholes. The system experienced a profound sense of relief coursing through her body. And she was relieved to be finished, but she didn't see a light blue glow on her hair. When that aura formed, the system began to materialize in front of him, and he was stunned as he looked at the saintess and then back at the system that was materializing in front of him. When the system was finished materializing, Chan saw a lot of question marks, and the system said, Please activate the function before using it, which he did by pressing where there were a lot of question marks. The saint sighed in contentment, telling the others how much better she felt after taking the force from the entrance of space. The system dissolved when Chan clapped his hands. The master's eyes shone with clarity, and he said, I get it now. Chan explained to the saintess that the saint items from the nine Jedi may help her repair her divine soul, and the nine Jedi is where nine of the strong to seal themselves in order to change their destiny. This is similar to the capacity of the door of space to warp time and space. Chan pulled out his phone and told her, He has a plan in mind. While the Empress was standing at the west entrance of Nine Dragon City, Chan called her and inquired if she could hear him. She said that she could, and she was intrigued as to why he had called her. Chan told her that although this may seem abrupt, the Nine Jedi are extremely essential to him, so when will you be able to send people there? He inquired. She informed him that she had just prepared a mission for the Third Army and had taken their pledge and that she would begin sending them right away. Chan expressed his approval and instructed her to open up the teleportation tunnel, as he had something to give her and the army. With a smile, she agreed, and she instantly constructed a teleportation for him. He entered the teleportation tube and landed on the western outskirts of Nine Dragon City. The Empress was the first to speak noting his apparent eagerness to locate her. She asked if there was an emergency. Chan told her that since she was going to war, he had some weapons here that might be able to help her. The strangest thing about this is that Chan isn't even asking why she's going to war, and he's already giving her powerful weapons that could kill in one shot. There was speculation among everyone about whether he had any weapons. The sight of Chan unveiling an unfamiliar, an advanced weapon left everyone in awe and confusion. The master showed them another weapon, informing them that it was really strong. How is it? He questioned, 
remaining focused on the weaponry and not on the horrified faces in front of him. The Empress, Yao Pond, Shuai Fanton, and Xiao Zhangbai were stunned. They couldn't believe he could pluck stuff out of thin air without the need of any magical instruments. What realm was he even in? In their thoughts, everyone wondered. Chan was just relieved that as long as the system was in place, he could still play around without cultivating. Chan informed her that she was exceedingly strong and that all of those weapons may not be appropriate for her. Therefore, she must take these sleeve arrows. He smiled, informing her that it could help her stay secure or perhaps murder someone. He even gave it a go himself. The Empress was amazed that this was the most powerful emperor soldier. After Chan left, she quietly reassured herself that Chan shouldn't be concerned and that she would take charge of this battle. She smiled and took an oath, declaring, I, the Chan dynasty, we will conquer the Middle East. Every soldier behind her was yelling, Conquer the Middle East. Chan returned to Miss Phoenix and inquired about the progress of the investigation. Miss Phoenix responded, stating that there was an earthquake a few days ago in Dongxi village that caused the tombs to fall, bringing all the corpses from ancient times to emerge from the ground. And the saintess said that their tranquility had been defiled. Therefore, their remains had transformed into ghosts and were hunting everywhere, as spirits were observed all over the place. Xiao Bai just smiled at him. Chan was pondering about what to do while numerous spirits stared and hissed at him, but he was too preoccupied with his thoughts to notice. That's a piece of cake, he remarked as an idea struck him. Simply gather all of the skeletons and burn them, he said, seemingly unfazed by the suggestion. The surrounding ghosts were taken aback in shock. It was a moment of realization for some, as they came to terms with the fact that they had become the hunted instead of the hunter. Both Miss Phoenix and the saintist jaws fell in surprise as they yelled in their heads. What? That is really too cruel. They were both terrified. Inside the heavenly demonic cave, the same female with nine tails and fox ears sat on this guy's lap and said in a seductive tone, Demon King, why are you so cold to me? Can't you just look at me? The Demon King was irritated with this lady, and he urged her to quit seducing and luring him, claiming he wouldn't fall for it again. The fox girl told the demon king that all of the ancient middle continent's greater powers had already awoken, but they were concealing themselves inside the nine Jedi. The fox girl didn't know whether they were scared of the ultimate. Emperor The demon king was taken aback and asked her what she had said. The demon king arrogantly addressed her, stating, As the demon king of the heavenly demon cave, there is no reason for me to fear an emperor realm cultivator. The fox girl let out a shriek as he forcefully pushed her away. The fox girl smiled seductively at him, claiming he stated so but behaved differently, and she asked him if he could treat her a little kinder, as a pink aura covered her body. The fox girl turned into a fox, and she decided that because he wasn't in the mood, she'd return another day, and she smiled. The demon king just cursed the fox women. Chino was within the heavenly demon cave when she shouted out to the demon king, and the fox girl quickly vanished. The demon king inquired furiously, Who dares to enter his cave palace without his permission? Chino approached him, but before she could say anything, she was gasping and puffing from exhaustion from all the running she had done, and the demon king was astonished and perplexed, because he smelled her as the spirit of the heavenly demon instrument. Chiner joyously smiled, verifying that it was her, and informed the demon king that she was coming to convince him to join the Great One. The demon king rose from his seat, darkly chuckling, as he couldn't believe this girl wanted him to follow the Great One. He inquired as to whether she wanted him to be under the supervision of someone else. When he stood up, crimson chains emerged in his arms, and Chiner smiled at him, urging him not to be upset and to listen to her. She grasped his hand or finger, explaining that the Great One was convinced he'd desire the Nine Jedi, and because he was her creator, she came here to find him, and the Demon King was filled with fury, his teeth clenched tightly. Sheena expressed her concern for him, unable to bear witness to his collapse. 
She acknowledged his anger towards her decision to choose another master but assured him that he would understand and approve once he witnessed the greatness of the new master. The demon king forcefully pulled his hand away from hers and raised his voice, berating her for her lack of knowledge. Sheena let out a piercing scream of pain. The demon king said, The instrument spirit I created is a beauty with nice boobs and booty. Hearing that, the fox women were dumbfounded. The demon king went on to say that even if she hadn't been a mature lady, she would have been a cold one. But who are you now? He snarled. Sheena was taken aback by what he said. The demon king continued to yell at her, screaming what sort of talentless bastard would call himself the Great One. He insulted Chan by saying that he is the strangest of strangios to adore pale, slender, and young women. And you can bet he'll never get along with them. The demon king was unaware that someone was listening in on what he was saying, and it was the fox girl who snickered, knowing that wasn't the point. Instead of agreeing or disagreeing with what Chiner stated, the demon king is talking about women. And the fox girl thought to herself, such a strange oh, and what he prioritizes is also strange, Chiner simply stood there sobbing. Chiner ran away weeping because she was upset because she claimed she's ugly. Before she went, she told him she hated him. The fox lady found this development intriguing and transformed back into her fox shape. She made a decision, and she believed it was time for a cup of tea. Sheena was on his way home. She wasn't aware of the fox lady following her. As he stared at what was in front of him, he huffed and was relieved that he was finally done. Miss Phoenix was dumbfounded, unsure of what was in front of her. Miss Phoenix inquired of young Master Chan what the purpose of installing these metal rods on the mountain top was, as did everyone else. There has been a significant increase in thunderstorms lately, Chan mentioned, expressing his intention to explore energy storage as a potential solution for the power supply problem. Miss Phoenix was amazed by Chan's ability to control the thunder. She found it puzzling that a human could accumulate thunder. Upon understanding his explanation, she was amazed to discover that thunder is a divine blessing and can be harnessed by humans. She seemed a bit confused in her statement. Chan heard what she said and said, Of course. Electricity is the most widely used resource on the planet. Ms. Phoenix listened attention to what he said next. Chan proceeded to inform her that what she stated about heaven granting is really simply yin yang ions in the sky colliding and making fiction, he added, pointing into the sky. Miss Phoenix misunderstood once more, but she did understand in her own way because she thought that operating with heaven is seen as yang, while operating against heaven is seen as yin, and yin and yang repel each other, just like how heaven would use thunder tribulation to test cultivators and she was impressed that this is the main rule that the Great One Mr. Chan operates heaven and earth with. Miss Phoenix bowed in reverence and told him, I understand now, young. Master Chan, thank you for your teaching. For a brief while, Chan was at a loss for words, to which he remarked, It's a good thing she understands. Chan wondered why he believed she had misunderstood his statement. Chan informed them that utilizing technology to store electricity in a rampart, like back on earth, would not be feasible. After delivering this message, he stumped on one of them. The system assured him that he had nothing to worry about since she had received full grades in her rune studies. Chan muttered to himself, He can only hope it works. A single thunderclap is enough to power the whole village for up to 100 years. Chan reasoned that the cultivation realm was the best. Miss Phoenix and the saintess exchanged blank stares. Okay, said Chan as he walked away. It's nearly mealtime in the village. He hummed to himself while walking. Miss Phoenix was astounded that people on earth are not only not frightened of heaven, but can even learn how to utilize it. It is very frightening, she said. The saintess agreed with her, adding it's one of his qualities she admires, and she's not sure if he's brilliant or courageous. Have you not got it? said the elder tree. He inquired aggressively. The elder tree stated that the Great One erected a lightning conductor on top of the mountain since their hardships at Earth Village were disrupting the Great One's peace. 
Miss Phoenix and the Saintess were taken aback when the elder tree yelled at them. Everyone who was present humbly expressed their understanding and pledged to exercise increased caution moving forward as they paid their respects to the elder tree. The Saintess also expressed gratitude for his advice. That's more like it, the elder tree said. The elder tree reminded them to be careful with their words and deeds, and not to bother the great one any more. The elder tree grumbled because they were such irresponsible people, and he still had to correct them. Oh gosh, why spend so much energy on them? remarked a lady as she caressed the tree's bark. She inquired seductively. The elder tree glances around to see who has touched him. The fox lady never imagined he'd still be such a sweetheart. After so long, the elder tree flushed as he could feel her melons on the bark of the tree, and he was shocked to see the empress nine-tailed fox. That's all for now.